My name is Andrew Murray. I'm from New West, and I've been asked to moderate tonight's meeting. And uh, New West is also very much alarmed by the plans to uh, for U.S. thermal coal at Fraser Surrey Docks. We're right across from it, and I'm frank, thankfully our city council has been very proactive. So uh, we're here to talk about coal. We're here to talk about coal on a, on a local uh, level, and we're also really pleased to have a special guest here from Appalachia in eastern U.S., Nick Bullens, who's going to talk about coal uh, in his part of the world and how it's affected his family and the environment that he lives in. So uh, this is going to be a public meeting, so right off the top, I, we're, we're going to have a Q&A at some point later on, and uh, we just want to remind people that there's going to be difference of opinion here tonight, and that uh, let's be respectful of all opinions and have a really creative dialogue, a positive dialogue. So. Moving forward, uh, the, the program for this evening is, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Paula Williams of Communities of Coal for a couple minutes and, and to talk about, uh, give you an update on where uh, the application is right now for Fraser Surrey Docks and what's going on in the courts. And then we're going to introduce our guest speaker, Nick Mullins from uh, Virginia, Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> who's traveled 3,400 miles across the U.S. to uh, talk to people, people about what coal is all about in his community. Uh, when Nick has finished his presentation, we are going to turn to the, the politics of coal and introduce some of our candidates that are going to be running in October's federal election. We have Joy Davies of the Liberal Party here. If you wouldn't mind just putting up your hand. Thank you. And we also have uh, Pixie, Pixie uh, Hobby. We have two other candidates that we invited that were unable to attend, but also have sent us statements, which I will be reading out at the appropriate time. Uh, we will be giving each candidate, uh, you'll be given a set of questions that were handed out. We have asked each candidate that are running in this riding to give answers to those questions on what their position is on, on coal, the project specifically, uh, Port Metro Vancouver and such. So each candidate will be given three minutes to state their position, state their comments on, on the situation. And then we're going to move into a question and answer period. And that will take us to, well, the meeting will try to be out of here by 9 o'clock. So for those of you who are not aware of what Communities in Coal is, it's uh, frankly a grassroots organization that started right here in Ocean Park about two years ago. And uh, it started because it became, they became aware of a plan by Fraser Surrey Docks and Burlington Northern and Port Metro Vancouver to turn uh, Fraser Surrey Docks into a major coal export, export facility uh, exporting U.S. thermal coal. And so it's for two years this small grassroots organization has reached out to like-minded organizations, unions, businesses, individual citizens, and two years later, we pretty well stopped them in their tracks right now. And uh, that all goes down to just grassroots people saying, no, this is the wrong time, wrong place in our history for this kind of a project. So uh, we have nine municipalities now that have signed on calling for an independent health impact assessment. There are still permits that are, are needed that Fraser Surrey Docks does not have at this point. And so things are very fluid. And the timing for this meeting is, could be more appropriate because we have an, uh, an opportunity in October, a federal election, to uh, really register our feelings about uh, the, the importation of U.S. thermal coal to be exported to Asia. We have a chance to, to champion that issue locally and really hold our politicians' speech to the fire and get their and get their impact on what it actually is. So at this point, enough of me. I'd like to bring up the the head organizer of Communities of Coal. I met Paula Williams two years ago in this building, and uh, since then I have seen what an articulate, and passionate woman this uh, she is a force to be reckoned with. Would you please welcome Paula Williams? for joining us this evening. I know your schedules are busy and it's the start of summer, so I really appreciate the fact that you're here tonight. Um, as Andrew said, um, I co-founded this group two years ago uh, when I found out that there was a proposal to ship U.S. thermal coal through our community. And it was actually two 
years to the day that we have our first town hall meeting in this location. And had you told me at that point that I would be back here two years later talking about coal, I would, I would not have believed you. But here I am, and I'm actually very happy to be here. Um, we've worked so hard. Um, I've worked with so many of you. I've met so many different people. And I'm so appreciative of, of the effort that we've put into this. Um, our hard work has made a difference, and we've managed to raise the awareness on this issue, I believe, to the point where government took notice and things started to happen. Um, from the beginning, we were asking for an independent, comprehensive health impact assessment, and of course, we have yet to receive one. But certainly uh, the work that we did helped to raise the dialogue on the subject of coal through our communities. And as many of you are aware, on August 14th, 2014, Port Metro Vancouver approved the proposal to ship coal uh, from Fraser Surrey Docks. So of course we didn't agree with this decision. And after speaking with our legal team at EcoJustice, Communities and Coal, along with voters taking action on climate change, and Christine Dumovich, a resident who lives directly across from Fraser Surrey Docks, and myself, we filed a legal challenge. And that was on September 2015. Um, in our legal challenge, I'm not sure if you're all aware, but what we're alleging is that the port failed to consider climate change impacts that will result from its decision to allow US thermal coal to be exported from Metro Vancouver and burned in Asian power plants. We're also alleging that the port's conduct gave rise to reasonable apprehension that it was biased. And lastly, that the chief executive officer of the port lacked the authority to make the decisions to approve the project. So soon after we filed, the cities of Surrey and New, West New Westminster announced their intention to intervene in our court challenge because they too had serious concerns about the, the decision made by the port. There's been a lot of delays behind the scenes. There's been lots going on with the legal challenge, um, but I'm happy to say that we expect Surrey and New West to appear before the courts um, in the middle of July. So once that's all worked out, and I feel confident that, or hopeful, that they will be able to join our, our legal case, most likely we'll go to court in the fall. So right now, there's actually, like, it was a little bit slow for a while, it's got busy again, but right now we're in the middle of fundraising for a legal challenge, and there's many of you who have been going door to door canvassing uh, to help us, and I, I'm so grateful for, for that support. But we're also focusing on two key areas, and one is the wastewater permit that Fraser Surrey Docks needs in order to dispose of their dirty coal laden water, and the other one is the air quality permit. They need to get a permit, both of these permits, from Metro Vancouver. So, um, if you want to find, I'm not going to go into the details of that tonight because we've got some great guest speakers and, and candidates. Uh, but if you want to find out more information on that, I encourage you to join our mailing list so that I can keep you in the loop. And lastly, before I hand the mic over, um, some people have questioned why we're going to court. And it's a good question, I've asked myself that <laughs> many times. But you know what, we're doing this because we feel that it's the right thing to do. And we're doing this not just for this community, but for the many communities that are going to be impacted by this proposal. And there's some communities, I think, that will be more impacted than others, and I really feel for those, for those communities. Like the individual who joined, put her name on the legal case, uh, Christine Dumovich. She lives right across from Fraser, Fraser Surrey Docks. And I spent some time at her house, and it's just, it's just unbelievable. It's, she's got full view of Fraser Surrey Docks, so there, it was never like that. She's been, her family's owned that property for a, a really long time, so you know, it's, it's really important for a lot of people. Um, and the other reason why I think it's important, the work that we've done, is when Fraser Surrey Docks first announced that they were going to um, go forward with this project, they hoped to have it up and running by 2013, probably fall or winter 2013. But you know, it's already summer of 2015, and, and there's still many obstacles ahead for Fraser Surrey Dogs. So this has been a long road, and I know it's far from over, but I really think that that's okay, um, because what it means is that as citizens, we've been doing our job, and that we're pushing the boundaries of citizen expectation. And I think that that's really important. And 
So again, thank you for coming tonight. And just remember that this evening is a reminder for you to exercise the power that you have by voting in the upcoming federal election. And that your voice is really important. That your voice, that your collective voice is really important. And you gotta think about what kind of future you wanna have. And this is your chance to vote for the person that will take you there. So thank you again for coming this evening. I hope you enjoy yourselves. And um, over to Andrew. Thank you, Paul. Dick Collins is a, a father, a husband, a ninth generation Appalachian. He's also a fourth generation coal miner. Both him and his wife are back in school in Berea College in Kentucky, majoring in communications and history. Uh, but Nick talks about grow growing up in the mountains of Appalachia where his brother was, special experience, of, and also the effects of being in a coal mining region and weathering many of the layoffs and strikes that came from being a family of union coal miners. He says he was raised knowing that coal companies were only around to make a profit, not to make the lives of Appalachian people better. So one day he made the decision to leave the mines and do what he could do to save Appalachia for future generations and give his kids a fighting chance at a better life. Please join me in welcoming Nick Mullins here tonight as he has traveled a long distance from home. And his family on a very good team tonight. And today is going to be a good Okay, well, I'm also a sustainability and environmental studies major, and one of the things that I've learned is that the average human being puts off 400 BTUs of biothermal heat. So what does that mean? We have a small space and a lot of people, and unfortunately I'm long-winded, so I run about 800 to 1,000 BTUs <laughs> compared to most other folks. Um, again, my name is Nick Mullins, and this is my wife, Rustina, or Rusty for short. And uh, we're storytellers. Uh, it just comes naturally as Appalachians. So we get caught on tangents and other things, so please forgive us. And we aren't judgmental. If you're uncomfortable where you're sitting, you need to get up, you need to move around, you need to go outside for a breath of fresh air or use the restroom, what have you. We will not judge, and we hope that nobody in the room would judge others. So, but, um, let's see here. The Appalachian Mountains are absolutely beautiful mountains. I didn't have the privilege of growing up in them, but I have learned that they have a very deep history and the people have a lot of culture still left within them. The mountains are covered with tremendous biomass. There's over 80 species of deciduous trees spread out through the mountains. They're the oldest mountains in the world. Well, as, people, as some people say. And the waters there were at least crystal clear for a while. Whenever my forefathers moved to the Appalachian Mountains in the mid, mid to late 1700s, they went there looking for the peace and quiet that could be afforded away from colonial civilization. They were somewhat separatists. The mountains provided them a place of refuge. And I can only imagine what it looked like to them whenever they first went there. The, the old growth forests, poplar trees, yellow poplar trees that were five foot in diameter. I, I just can't fathom it. They really enjoyed, or they, they must have enjoyed it because they didn't move west. During times of the, the California gold rush, during the, the large uh, industrializations that were occurring and, and cities were growing up and popping up everywhere, the western territories were being explored, they stayed put in the Appalachian Mountains. It was a hard life, but it was a simple one. They built cabins, they made their home the best way that they could. They used the forests as part of their food supply. They grazed gardens um, during the time that the Cherokee were around. Them. They made friends rather than enemies. I mean, if they hadn't, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, 
My uh, sixth great my sixth great grandfather was living in Western North Carolina with his father whenever he was going on long range hunts into Eastern Kentucky, and he found an area that he called Holly Creek, a little town called Clintwood, uh, that's now called called Clintwood. Um, he moved his family there, and that's where we had pretty much stayed since the late 1820s. Again, it was a sustenance agriculture type of life. And they lived this way for close to 100 years until other people saw the mountains for their natural resources outside of the freedom and food that, the, that my ancestors saw it as. The timber companies came in buying up timber rights, laying waste to the forests. Speculators came in buying up mineral rights. There are uh, stories that passed down to my family and many families throughout Appalachia where they would come in and get hundreds of acres of mineral rights or rights to the coal beneath for as little as a couple of hogs or perhaps a rifle or pennies on the acre. That was a lot to these people. They were, un they were uneducated. There wasn't a school system during those times. Most people signed their name with an X and sometimes they're not, their X was put down for them without them not even knowing. So the timber companies came in and they started laying waste to the forests. And they took everything. Clear cutting it to manufacture the hardwood trim and flooring that would be sent to places like Chicago and New York. By this time, it was my great grandfather's time, both Mullins and Hawkins, that had settled down on Georgia's Fork. My uh, great grandfather Hawkins, forced more or less into an economic way of life, became a logger. Here he is pictured on one of the trucks. My other great-grandfather, Mullins, started a small steam-powered sawmill to supply local lumber. Of course, the forest never lasted. And whenever the timber industry started pulling up stakes and there was very little left for the locals, it became very hard times. My great-grandfather, Mullins, turned to alcohol and unfortunately a pistol. My great-grandfather, Hawkins, he saw opportunity in the coal mines. The Appalachia Basin stretches all the way up into Pennsylvania and all the way south to Alabama. And there's this one little sliver of Virginia that I don't think that my sixth great grandfather, John Mullins, realized would be so wealthy in coal. So they started bringing in their mines, Clinchfield Coal Company to begin with. They worked their men hard. They, at that time, it was what they called pony mines, or pick and shovel mines, where men hand loaded the coal. They had to use breast augers in order to be able to drill holes into the coal seam to load it with dynamite, to blast it and break it up, and then bust it down with the pick and shovel it into the coal car, which was then pulled out by a mule. They were paid by the ton and not by the hour. They would bring their children along with them, their sons, to help load coal so that the family could have more money. They had to buy all their own tools at the company store. So, and if you're a poor Appalachian who's down on his luck, used to be a logger, you're going to need money to buy those tools. Well, the company would help you out there. They'd give you a good line of credit at the company store. And you could buy everything that you needed to start in their minds. And they would have you on day one in debt. But at least my grandfather fared better than most. A lot of the immigrants and African Americans that were being brought in were put into coal camps where they were paid in company script and they were paid and they used that script to buy everything at the company store and to buy or pay the rent in the company housing. There are many, many stories in Appalachia of miners who would get hurt or killed in the mines and within a day that their family would be tossed out of the company housing so another family and miner could go to live there. It was very, very tough times. I will never know the amount of hard work that my great grandfather had to put in to work in the mines, or the many of the men of that age. But they realized that they were being enroached upon by greed from outside sources, and they knew they could be treated better. So they ended up trying to form a union. And this is actually a story account that, uh, of that time. Thank you.
coal companies like they are now. They had the upper hand for all the law enforcement in Virginia is against labor. I understand that Virginia at that time had 150 state police. They had 110 of them down here in Prince Coal. Number nine bridge, the union members was on the other side of the river. So one morning, Colonel Battle walked up on that bridge, draw the line with his foot. He said, the first damn man that crosses that line said, we'll blow him into hell. And he pointed back behind him on the hill and they had four machine guns sitting up on that hill. And I honestly believe if a man to cross that line, I believe he'd kill him. So that's, that's the kind of trouble we had here about organizing. Dark clouds rise, sure sound of rain. The men wouldn't be going around like bank mules after they organized. And I worked at mine for a news And they all actually abused. And the coal miner was too. But uh, after we were organized, then things started changing and changing for the better. I like all you, for you do have a chance to stand up for yourself. And that was the story all throughout Appalachia. Appalachian people were strong with their communities. They took care of one another. And what happened on the surface happened in the underground too. My grandfathers, my great grandfather, they enjoyed working in the mines after the union was brought in because they had a family of workers to be with. And things did get better for a good while. Eight hour work days, better pay, better safety, my grandfathers, whenever they came back from World War I, or excuse me, World War II, and my other grandfather who came back from the Korean War, they were able to come back to Union Mines, where they were treated well, and they had a hope for a retirement and a decent career. And this lasted for many, many years. And whenever it was my dad's turn to go in the mines, he had a good, strong union to go into. He found a job with Bethlehem Steel, they mined their own metallurgical coal in Appalachia, and they treated everyone well. I was able to witness some of the, the way that the union brought our communities together. In 1989, Clinchfield Coal Company, then owned by Pittston Coal, decided that they were going to just up and get rid of all the health care benefits for the pensioners. All of a sudden, retirees, Disabled minors and widows received letters in the mail saying you no longer have health care insurance. People wouldn't stand for it though. And I remember the day in school whenever they came running down the halls yelling that they walked out. 1,400 minors walked off the job and said we're not standing for that. And it, it grew. And it eventually ended up in an international strike. But during those nine months, I saw my community come together like I'd never seen them come together before. If somebody needed food, they got food. We raised gardens. We did everything we could to support one another. But it wouldn't last. Coal markets go up and down. In the 90s, the coal market busted, and the companies used it as an opportunity to be able to shut down all their union operations. They kept the non-union dog hole mines where they kept scabs working for a little while. But I saw my dad go through some tremendous life changes. He all of a sudden went from the strong man who was able to provide everything his family needed and wanted to scraping by, working in some of the dog hole mines and coming home with blood on his teeth, crawling around. He would work on garbage trucks. He would lay natural gas pipeline. Anything he could do to scrape a living together for our family. Our families never wanted to see the next generation go into the coal mines because they knew it wasn't something that could be, that would last. They knew it would take a toll on their body. My great grandfather passed away a black lung whenever I was six years old. I have no memory of that man without a nasal cannula in him, or on him. The day he was baptized, they had to rush him to the shore to get him back to his oxygen. He was gasping for breath. That's a memory I'll live with for the rest of my life. I know what the coal industry will do to people. So we did try to strive and do better in school like our parents asked. But I didn't do well enough and I didn't go on to college. 
I instead decided to try to strike out on my own and uh, move away to avoid a life in the coal mines. My brother ended up joining the military. I moved to Indiana hoping to be a firefighter. I grew up outside of Rockville, Indiana on a small farm, the daughter of a farmhand and a nurse. I enjoyed my life. It was full. We, uh, we got to run around in the woods and, and we enjoyed trying to figure out how to get through the cornfields without getting too lost. <laughs> but whenever I was 18, I thought I could do things better than my parents. So as soon as I graduated high school, I moved out. I was out on my own. And whenever I was working one night, that's whenever I met Nick. He came in to where I was working. We started talking. He told me he was from the mountains. And I told him I always loved the mountains. So when everything fell through with the fire fireman's position, I ended up moving back and dragging her along the way. Whenever I got back to Indiana, I was Though so his dad gave, gave him some news. He said that the, the mountain above the house was uh, slotted to be stripped. Strip mine. A&G Coal Industry had shown interest in being able to access the Kent Clintwood seam on the mountain that was back behind my home. It was the mountain that I grew up on. It was our backyard. It was where me and my brother and our cousins would go and play for hours on end. It was full of life. It was, you know, trees. We, we would go up there every spring to, to search for morel mushrooms on the back side of the ridge. It's where I saw my first flying squirrel and many other animals. I remember seeing a fox up there at one time. They threw around a new term called mountaintop removal, and we'd heard very little about it. It was, it was something that they just started in West Virginia. I wanted to fight it because I didn't like strip mining. I didn't like what it had done to the land because they'd done it up and down the hollow before. And uh, I knew that it would affect our spring that we got our water from. But at the same time, several of my great uncles and my grandfather all had land also on the mountain that they would get some of the coal from or some of the money that they would uh, pay in royalties for the coal. And I also had an uncle who'd been disabled, permanently disabled in the mine and been through three back surgeries and had no pension. I knew that they needed the money. So I just sat back. I just got concerned with my own issues and I let them ravage the mountain that was so important to me. But the thing about um, Appalachia is, is you have to struggle to make it economically. And that's where my focus ended up happening or ended up going to. Nick swore he would never go into the mountains. So instead, he got a job working at one of the one of the technology jobs that was brought in during the 90s, uh, during the coal bust. He worked for Crutchfield Corporation, for, and he did really well. He, he was really good at his job. He received several awards. He was the he became the youngest supervisor in his department, and eventually became the department trainer for the entire corporation. And we were doing so well, we decided it was time to start a family. After a few years, we were still doing okay, and we decided to expand our family. But a small two-bedroom trailer was not big enough for the four of us. So Nick's parents, or Nick's great-grandmother, had passed away, and his parents talked us into moving into her house so that the family didn't have to worry about it falling to ruin. So we moved in and we started doing work on it as we, as we could. But the improvements ended up causing us to kind of start working on living paycheck to paycheck. And we started paying a little closer attention to our finances and we got to realizing we weren't going to have a whole lot for the future. Nick didn't have much of a retirement with that job. 
I was so happy to be able to be raising the 10th generation down the valley, the same valley that I could take them whenever they got older to graveyards and they could visit all the way back to their seventh great grandfather's grave. Georgia's work was a special place. I felt that I had a tremendous childhood being raised in the mountains in a simple life. But I came to terms that Crutchfield just wasn't cutting it. It was a dead end job. I had gone as high as I could go and I only had $7,000 after seven years of, to, to speak up for retirement, so. <clears throat> he looked everywhere, trying to, find, trying to find a better job that actually offered retirement. And we talked about it, and he told me that he had no choice. He was going to have to go into the coal mines. The railroads wouldn't hire him, or well, they were hiring, but the jobs are so competed for in the poorest areas of the nation. You know, I went up for a Norfolk Southern job and I beat out a thousand applications to be one of 400 to go to a hiring session for two conductor positions. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the nepotism connections that other people had. I didn't have any family working for the railroad. And the same ended up happening for the phone company and the power company. I think the power company hired uh, one person in 20 years and it was the son of one of the technicians. <laughs> so I came to terms. I knew that the coal companies were hiring, the coal markets rebounded, they were hiring red hats, you know, entry level miners by the droves. And, uh, but I decided that, I, by the time I decided there was a lull in the coal market, so they'd stopped hiring. And I started looking for any job I could within the industry to get myself an in. He finally landed a job working for a construction outfit, putting in mine fans and escape hoist. Mm -hmm. He was gone all the time. Uh, he, he would be gone upwards of 16 days in a row sometimes. The, the kids ended up only seeing their daddy via Skype, only if he was lucky enough to get a hotel that had good wireless internet or internet at all. But it gave me the experience, and I finally was able to land a job at one of the largest mines in Virginia, the second largest actually, that was only seven miles from home. Consequently, in a slower scene than the ones that my great-grandfather and grandfathers had worked in. At first, I was eat up with it. And by that, I mean that I was 100% pro-coal, amen, miner. We are, you know, the baddest people on this planet. You know, we sacrifice our health and we go into a dangerous place every day to, set, to, to give our kids what they want and need. He was so proud whenever we would go shopping, he would have to make sure that he was wearing his Paramount hat saying Deep Mind 26. I even believed that without the union, or that we didn't need the unions anymore. The companies were doing things much safer, it seemed. Um, that's all that they seemed to preach was safety. And, and the health care was excellent. Yeah, the health care benefits and the pay was excellent. You know, I went from making roughly $13 an hour up to making 22 and then eventually 28 as I got to be a mine electrician. But it was, after a while, things were a lot more, or they, they weren't as good as what they originally seemed to be. I guess the best way to put it. And this, he became, he, the stress that he experienced at work bled over in the home, and it was really rough on us. There was a lot of times he would work, they would have him work in the third shift, and it's really hard to keep a, a three and a five-year-old quiet whenever somebody's trying to sleep during the day. I brought work home with me, and I shouldn't, and I really wasn't a good father to my children, and I'll be the first to admit it. I yelled at them, and I screamed at them sometimes, <laughs> There was a lot of stress at work. The family that I'd hoped to find in that small sliver of Appalachian community that used to be in the mines was gone. The coal companies have been smart. Whenever they got rid of the union, they got rid of the community. They hired younger miners, often recruiting them straight out of high school. They would get the, and a lot of times these younger miners would be you know, part of the instant gratification generation. They would partner up the coal companies would partner up with the Chambers of Commerce and get these miners open lines of credit at dealerships and at, at, at banks for home mortgages. One gentleman I worked with had a $1,500 house payment and a $1,300 vehicle payment, which is quite extensive back home. 
And he was working 90 hours a week to be able to keep up. He was drinking two monsters, two of the tall monster drinks a night and taking a beverage. And I told him, I said, Nathaniel, honey, you're going to kill yourself by the time you're 35. The companies also knew that they could put a little spin on things. And whenever the coal market was going low, they would always call and tell, hey, boys, or send out ladders. You know, if, uh, if things get real bad, we're going to have to have layoffs. And if we do, they'll be performance-based. Without the protection of the union and with at-will work laws, meaning that they can fire you at any time without any reason at all, every miner in that mine was always scared of whether or not they were going to be able to have a job. And if their performance is better than the next man's. So that look out for number one attitude had taken over for the family that had once existed in the mines. And I got caught up in it. Nick decided to start talking to the union and figure and, and figure out if, if they would come in and help him. But um, I found out that the union at this present day United Mine Workers wasn't very much interested in organizing. They hadn't been an organizing drive in you know in at least you know about five years and the, the full-time organizers at the office, you know, 30 miles away weren't lifting a finger. Whenever I did get in contact with them and I did let them know who I was and what my name was, things began to change around the mine. They put me on third shift after I'd been on day and night rotating for a while. It was, uh, it was a bad time. But I did know that the environmental organizations were trying to work, you know, help with workers' rights, so I started getting in contact with them. Those things just, they, they didn't improve. Things got worse. We, uh, Nick was on a, a, a long weekend where they had messed with the schedule. He ended up with, with a few extra days off. And we decided to take advantage and, and uh, do some more improvements on the house that we had been planning. Unfortunately, it wasn't the improvements that we should have been doing. I never got around to the electrical and it came back to bite us. We lost everything. We had a fire. It took everything. Everything that we had worked for, everything that my great grandfather and grandmother had put together and worked for, was gone in one night. But losing everything made us start thinking about I went back to work at the mines with a, a different attitude. I realized that we could have easily lost our lives in that fire. And that material things aren't that important compared to that. A lot of family and a lot of friends in the community came to our aid and environmental organizations. Once they got one of it, they came to my aid. But at the mines, I guess I was too much of a rabble rouser to get any sympathy. People just treated me the same and, and even worse in some cases. One gentleman, after I had a really rough night and wasn't able to get a lot done, he, uh, he threatened to fight me at the gate. So I decided that enough was enough. And even though I understood that those, uh, you know, even though I had a lot of, I, I saw what they were doing to me, and I never held it against the miners themselves because I knew it was the companies that had forced them into that kind of situation to be that way. There was one night Nick went to work, and I didn't expect him to come back until morning, but he came back an hour later, and he told me, I'm fed up. He said, why am I risking my life? After, we, after our lives were spared, why am I risking my life? And from there, we started really looking around us and thinking about everything, everything that our environmentalist friends have been trying to say. <laughs> It just started becoming clearer and clearer. We started seeing more and more of the destruction that was going on and realizing that as a coal miner, I wasn't just moving dirt around, that there was a lot more to it. Um, the strip mining that was around the house became even more evident to us. Um, I started really learning about the process. They would drill holes down into the mountain and fill them up with explosives and detonate them. Benign. 
It's just dirt, right? It's just rocks. But what we started finding out through our environmental friends and through the water tests was that they were surfacating, they were breaking up into fine particles, all these different heavy metals and minerals. Heavy metals like arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and it was making its way into the water supplies. The best way that I've heard it described is like rock salt. You have a solid piece of rock salt, you pour water over it, and what comes at the bottom is just, it's not very salty. You take that rock salt, you pound it into fine powder, you pour water over it, and what do you end up with? Full of salt and Everything nasty as all kitted out. Whenever the mountaintop will move, they fill in the valleys. And I never really thought twice about it. But it, removed, it, it completely eliminates the headwater streams. What was clear mountain streams fed by springs is now a brita filter of death. It's the cheapest way to do it. The acidic mine drainage is everywhere. That clear mountain spring that I talk, told you about that we used for four generations, it began belching out orange as soon as they started the blasting. We also learned that, uh, and kind of opened our eyes to the coal processing that occurs. The, it doesn't end with just the extraction. They have to clean the coal, and they use chemicals to do that. And these chemicals are, well, they're bad. Yeah. <laughs> really bad. Consider once they got to the Charleston water supply for a tank washer that nobody could use their water for two weeks. 300,000 people couldn't use their water for two weeks. And it has a byproduct called coal slurry. It's full of toxic chemicals, coal fines, heavy metals, manganese is a big one. And they just put it back in a hollow and they dam it up. And they build a dam higher and they pump it full. And I've kind of got to thinking about that these days, and I wondered, what if we were to take those and put those in open ponds like they do in Telling's Ponds in, in, in the river, in Athabasca? And I have talking, no doubt that they would be very similar in size. We're talking billions of gallons and that's of no this accurate, nasty stuff. Accuration. Billions of gallons. And these, these dams are not made by people who make dams professionally. They're made by the coal companies. So they're, they, they, they're, they're made to fail. Well, yeah. The one, one failed in 1972 and it took 128 lives in a morning flood. Men, women, and children in Buffalo Creek, West Virginia. This is the IMS Kentucky coal story spill. 300, close to 300 million gallons that ended up in everybody's creeks. And of course, sometimes they don't have enough room in their impoundments anymore. So they just start pumping it down into old abandoned mines which worked their way through the aquifers to get into people's groundwater. Cabin Creek, West Virginia, people um, started coming up with cancers left and right. They eventually uh, got a little bit of settlement to the tune of almost $40 million. But they had a gag order not to talk about it, but they still did. That's Appalachian people. <laughs> but at the same time, we started realizing too that all these nasty, horrible things were right next door to us, all the coal prep plants. This is just a few miles from the house. This right here, just beyond this tree line and down the hill is where my family spring was. One morning we woke up and we saw the creek, six feet wide creek, about maybe what, three, four feet deep, purely milky white. Well, we started tracing this creek back to find out where the white was coming from. And this is what we found. Some mechanic had let loose the hydraulic fluid out of one of the major machines up on the strip mine and it washed down throughout the night whenever we had heavy rainfall. So that got us to thinking, where does that water go? Where does the water from our acidically, or this is our spring, from the acidic mine range, it's now coming out of our spring. And we started, uh, let's see here. We started, looking around a little bit more. And uh, a lot of times you can't see as much from the road, but Google Earth is really nice. This right here is where I grew up, and this is where we were living, and this is the part of the valley. All these open areas that look like a golf course, these are mines. 
These are abandoned strip mines that have been reclaimed using, or basically where they go back, try to scrape a little bit of topsoil back onto it, and then they have to seed it with special grasses like Lespedeza, which is brought in from China, because nothing else will grow there. They can't get native trees hardly to grow, it's, but it's great for invasive species like Audubon. But you can see here just all the different, the, the white dot or white blotches are active mines. Here's one that's been going since the 1970s. And these aren't clouds. These are other mines all throughout central Appalachia. Hundreds and sometimes thousands of acres. And all of the water draining off of these mines. And out of old abandoned underground mines that are soaked with similar amounts of oil. I have no pride in saying that we drain 55 gallons a month of beer oil straight onto the ground in the mines whenever we change the oil in the mine or because it was easy. And one of my friends would joke, <laughs> I hear up in some places horror stories that the EPA makes them catch this stuff. But all that water goes to the municipal water supply. Which is Flanagan Reservoir. Almost 100 years of mining, countless strip mines. There's hardly a mountain that hasn't been touched. It's now leaching out these heavy metals, and God knows what's been left behind by the mining and what was maybe stored in these mines and some of the wildcat mines from local chemical companies. There's instances of that happening. It really made us rethink whether or not Georgia's Fork was the place for our kids to grow up, especially whenever we started seeing statistics. For instance, if people are twice as likely to develop cancer, 181% higher chance of having birth detect defects in cardiovascular and respiratory. 235 out of 10,000 births of them, sorry, yeah, could have birth defects compared to 144 per 10,000 in non-mining areas. 70% increase for developing kidney disease. 64% increase for developing chronic pulmonary disease, like emphysema. 30% more likely to report hypertension and 11,000 <coughs> premature deaths. So all these statistics just led us to understand that we couldn't live there anymore. We had to get our kids out of there. Do you know what the word alpha stands for? First, number one, a leader. The name suits us well. At Alpha Natural Resources, there is no second best when it comes to running right. It's why we always put our people first, why safety is our number one commitment, and giving back to the community and the environment our top priorities. At Alpha, we're proud that our name really stands for Running Right. Running Right. Running Right. Running Right. Running right. But the coal industry has a whole different story to tell. <laughs> This is the things that are popped into our area to tell everybody that things are okay. And at the same time that we were realizing that our kids couldn't live in the place that we call home for 10 generations, that the coal, you know, we also realized the coal industry had been lying to us all throughout. And we realized how much power that they had. Here's the state, or here's the governor of Kentucky proudly displaying the new Friends of Coal license plate. The 50% of the proceeds of purchasing this license plate goes to educating the public about the wonders of coal. <laughs> <laughs> and scholarships, college scholar in the university scholarships at UK, University of Kentucky, in mine engineering. We also realized just how divided we were as a people and how much the environmental organizations are loathed and how much the people of Appalachia are not now fighting for coal. The community that I had heard Nick brag about was no longer alive in Appalachia. It was now a thoroughly coal community, and people had somehow forgotten that the coal industry had, did all these, had done all these horrible things to our ancestors. This is at the EPA hearings that were going to be held, or that were being held in Pikeville about mountain top removal jobs. And as you can see by the enthusiasm of some of these people, Kentucky Electricity, third cheapest in the nation. Coal supports my family. Coal, coal, coal. And it gets worse. They've been going into our schools and teaching them their own version of school, or of coal. Like with the... Uh, like with the CEDAR program. 
which is coal education development and research. Or resources. <coughs> they designed K through 12, which is kindergarten through 12th grade, and you know, lesson plans, state certified to go into local schools and teach kids about the history of coal, which often does not include the same, uh, how should I say, it's uh, emphasis on labor struggles in the way life was in coal camps. In fact, they say that to today many decry the life of the coal in coal camps, but many of the people working there in, in the coal mines fared far better than the poor sharecroppers, the people living or working in uh, sweatshops. So, uh, even though 100,000 coal miners died or died in uh, in the U.S. from 1880 to 1950, over 100,000. And they would have have fairs with the with the cedar program to where kids could get a hundred dollars if they want. Well. Kids had a choice. They could do the, the history or social studies or, or science, but those only gave ribbons. Most of the kids went for the one that would get them money. So we, we, we realized we had to leave, and we wanted to do the best that we could for our children. So we found the best, uh, a good community called Berea, Kentucky. They not only had wonderful you know, schools for the kids, they also had very clean water that was in a protected forest. And Berea College, where we began attending. And there, in a sense, we have been learning so much more about the bigger picture beyond just the extraction issues in Appalachia. We learned that uh, after the coal gets cleaned, where it goes and what happens whenever it's burned in these power plants. Well, of course, we knew that power was generated by coal, but we didn't realize just how much of the mercury was making it out to the world and into people's water how that all the clean coal scrubbers that are taking out all the bad stuff to prevent acid rain still ends up in our environment in the form of ash ponds that leak out into our rivers. We began finding other people and other struggles with coal, including the elders, the Navajo elders of Black Mesa of the Navajo Nation. Who are resisting forced relocation so that Peabody Energy can mine the coal from their mountain. We began connecting the dots and seeing that this devastation is everywhere and it's not just coal either. Well, the first paper exams I did, I did, wrote a paper on the Athabasca River Basin in the tar sands. I started learning more about what's happening in the Niger Delta. And then, of course, we got to realize, you know, thinking even more stronger about hydraulic fracturing with natural gas, which is usurping coal as the nation's, uh, one of the nation's primary energy sources. And that got us thinking the back home because I used to see a lot of natural gas drilling. And then I found this map on the Energy Information Administration's website that shows all the natural gas wells that are in our area. Every single blue dot represents a well. Every single dot represents one well. That's if you back out a little bit. <laughs> now here's uh, in Berea is right here and we used to live right in this little area we were in a pocket where there wasn't any direct natural gas drilling but all of that still ends up into the you know what comes back out can easily end up in the Flanagan Reservoir we would see these tanker trucks hauling water all the time and they said it's just brown water just salt water from the it's burnt back up from the wells we didn't know that that brown water also has radioactive materials chemicals and that they were taking it to a what an area they call the middle of the world to inject it back down into the ground into a deeper well from the injection well site. And that's if the truck actually made it there and the man who's driving the truck didn't want to go home early and just dump it in the creek. So yeah. So since we've started at school, we've started making connections. And one of the one of the connections that we're making is how the Powder River Basin is the stronghold for coal. See, right now, coal isn't doing really well in Appalachia. The, the market has bottomed out yet again. There have been thousands of coal miners who have been laid off. Appalachian coal is not as marketable. So everybody's shifting their sites to the Powder River Basin to kind of keep it alive. And the people out there are suffering just as well, too. Their mines are massive. And where they're not, while they're not blowing up mountains, they're digging huge trenches, and we unfortunately couldn't get over to take a proper picture. 
because of trespassing and laws and things like that. But, and, and kids, you know, kids weren't with us, we've been out there. Um, but also, how much train traffic it causes. As we were coming this way through Nebraska, we were passing a coal train about every 10 minutes. We stopped in a little town in Nebraska called Broken Bow. And I went out for a stroll that night, and every 10 to 15 minutes, the rail crossings were going, the, 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 the road crossing, rail crossings were going off for another train going through that area. I talked to the lady who, at the hotel, and I was like, y'all get a lot of trains here, don't you? She says, oh, Lord. She says, it's horrible. She says, they overload them. She says, there's been so many accidents. And I said, did you think about the diesel particulate matter? That was this area of interest that I found out um, working in the mines because we had started really using diesel equipment underground. The National Institution, uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health has deemed diesel particulate matter a possible carcinogen. So it can cause lung cancer. So all these communities living up and down these rail lines, we're going to have to be contending with that and the coal dust and the heavy metals and other things that are in the coal dust that comes off of it. Yeah, I don't care how much you spray those coal trains down with whatever. Chemicals. They still, they, the coal dust will still come off. So basically, our journeys, our travels, our education, and our life has been just one long lesson. And it's a depressing one, unfortunately. We've lost the home that we have. I can, with, with all the natural gas flow, with all the coal mining and everything that's occurred, I cannot tell anybody to go back home and live and not worry about cancers and kidney diseases and all these other problems that are cropping up. I just can't. But what I can do, and what we can do, is come out and make the connections with other people and show them what's happening in other places. Right now, you're not just fighting for your communities. You're fighting for communities that are all along this rail line that's going all the way back to, back, back, back to the Powder River Basin. You're fighting for the families that live in the Powder River Basin. For the children that live in those regions. For the Northern Cheyenne tribe, for the Crow, who are going to be affected by these trains. Who's safe, who has sacred land that is slated to be mined if they can get these ports put in. For fourth generation ranchers like Clint and Wally McRae, two wonderful People who opened up their homes, their ranches for us, and are now fighting a, a rail line that's going to go through their farm, through their ranch, and dissect it, possibly cause fires, and, and just wreak havoc. Plus, they're having to fight the coal ash from a nearby coal-fired power plant. There are people all across this world who are fighting various battles. But what we have to understand is that all of it is connected. It's not just the people in Powder River Basin and along the rail lines. You're fighting for the people in China, the people in India, the people in third world developing countries who are going to be burning this coal without the proper environmental regulations. The people who aren't allowed to speak up and say no. You're going to be, you're fighting for ourselves because once that stuff goes up in the atmosphere, it's going to come back on us <coughs> through the jet streams. And I don't know where people stand on global climate change, you know, a lot of people, you know, I think it's a bunch of hockey. No, I'm just joking. It is there. We're against Yes, we're against it. Absolutely. I mean, as I've tried to explain it to some of my coworkers, you know, how can you get rid of 50% of the world's forests in the last 200 years and develop technologies that unearth billions of tons of coal, billions of barrels of oil, and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas, put that stuff up in the atmosphere and not expect some sort of repercussion. And you're all, you know, everywhere we go, it seems like everybody's complaining about how the weather is, how the fire seasons are getting worse. You know, and then we could just go on and on about carbonic acid in the air, in the sea, melting permafrost, it's all there. We're fighting for future generations. So if there's any one ask that we have, it's that you stick together and that you also go out into your communities and you realize that we're fighting for more than just one community. We're fighting for every community. We're fighting for each other. We're fighting for our future generations. I went to the coal mines to, be, to give my kids a better future that I thought I could give to them through money. Now I realize I'm having to do it by going out 
not speaking to people and trying to stop these coal companies and these natural gas companies and these oil companies from continuing to destroy their, their future. say this, and I don't mean to be a demo gloomer, but just as long as those resources exist and people want cheap energy, it's going to be another administration, it's going to be another company, another set of lawyers picking up the fight to get to it and make money on it. So we also have to be thinking about our schools, thinking about how we can teach our children and the rest of our communities how to be more energy efficient, about solar and renewables, like wind and how we can just become a better race as a people, even feed ourselves and find more freedom, free from uh, the economic uh, shackles that bind us all and have enslaved Appalachia for so many years. So, this is what the mountains should like, look like, but they're not that way anymore. We've got to do something to preserve what we have left. Thank you. Thank you.